Let's turn to Exodus, the second book of your Old Testament, and let's go to the 29th chapter. So Exodus chapter 29, hope you got a Bible, because you're going to need it. Exodus 29, this has been through this here in my Bible reading recently in Exodus, and uh, it's really exciting, and then you get into around chapter 22 or so, and it, it's a little bit dry, but nevertheless, every word of God is pure, right? Amen. And uh, I, I, reading this past week here, came across uh, the pastor we're going to read, just really, uh, really some good stuff. So uh, even if the Bible, if you're in a place in your Bible where it's not exciting, it's still good for you, isn't it? It's kind of like, before I met my wife, I didn't like broccoli, and she likes broccoli, and now I kind of like broccoli. Uh, I put enough seasoning on it to make it edible for myself. But that stuff is good for me. So even if you don't like something, it's still good. It can be still be good for you, right? So this is one of the places in the Bible that you say, man, why is all this detail in here? And there's a reason why. So, and I will get some of that today. So go to Exodus 29 and go down to verse 15. We'll read verse 15 down to verse 21. Verse 15, thou shalt also... Take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inwards of him and his legs, and put them into his, unto his pieces and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire, unto the Lord. Verse 19. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt, then shalt thou kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. All right, so uh, probably some detail there. You're thinking, man, what is that all about? And we'll get into that this morning here. So let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us. Well, Lord God, we thank you that we have these pure words in front of us. And as we uh, go through these verses this morning, I uh, want you to be the one that actually reveals the truth to us. We know that that's the only way that we'll actually understand. And we pray for you to be glorified. We pray for there to be no distractions from all of us hearing from you. And I just pray this message would be something that all of us use immediately starting today and throughout this week and apply it put it into action uh, we do pray that the name of jesus christ be exalted this morning and again that your words just go forth very clear and plain and we pray this in jesus name amen all right so this is a portion of exodus that tells you about instructions for the priests and you might be thinking to yourself why do we need to read about the priests and why is this guy preaching about the old testament priesthood that's a good question so Keep your finger here and go to 1 Peter in your New Testament. When you read your Bible, you want to remember that the Old Testament provides great illustrations of New Testament truths. So go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and when you read it in Exodus, you understand that's a portion of the scripture addressed specifically to, not just the Israelites, but to the priests. Okay, so that's not something that we are today, or are we? Let's find out. 1 Peter 2, look down there at verse 9. This is addressed to believers, 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal, what's it say? A royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, Anybody here been called out of darkness into his marvelous light? Okay, a few, yeah. If you're saved, you were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
And according to that verse right there, you are a part of a royal priesthood. It would do us all well to go back and find out a little bit about the Old Testament priesthood because there's something to learn for us today. Now go back to Exodus and you want to, if you want to thank God for something this morning, thank the Lord that you do not have to go and offer an animal sacrifice for your sins. They had to do that in the Old Testament. Not just once, over and over again. The reason why you and I don't need to do that today is because the greatest sacrifice for sins has been offered. We sang about his blood this morning, uh, saved by the blood of who? The crucified one. Who's that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't need to offer an animal sacrifice this morning. Thank the Lord for that. The, the final payment's been made once and for all. But notice something that we can learn from from this passage. So yeah, let's go just real quick here. Verses 15 through 17. Notice here something about two different animals that are offered. The first one beginning in verse 15. And you can apply these verses I'm going to read here to a picture of our salvation. Look at 15. Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Now, uh, before we go on there, what they do is they put their hands on that ram, on this head, indicating a transfer, and specifically a transfer of the person's sins upon, from the person upon the animal, the ram. So that person, that person's sins going on the ram, because what were they about to do to the ram? Well, let's read the next verse. Verse 16, and thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar. So the animal died instead of the person or the persons, right? Now look at verse 17, look what they did. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash the inwards of him and his legs and put them unto his pieces and unto his head. So there's a whole process there. And look at verse 18. And thou shalt do what? What's that next thing? Thou shalt what? Burn the whole ram upon the altar. Better in the Old Testament for the animal to burn instead of the person. Do you know what's going to keep you from burning for all of eternity? The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. See the whole picture here? This animal suffered on behalf of the individual offering the animal sacrifice. Who suffered in your place? Are you saved? Then who suffered in your place? Jesus Christ. He suffered so you won't have to eternally. Amen to that. You're not, you don't have to worry about that fire. That fire there I read about is a picture of hell. I don't have to worry about that. Neither do you if you're saved. All right. So whole picture of salvation there. Now you get down to verse 19. And notice there's another animal offered. So that first animal, that's a picture of salvation. Look at the second one. This is a picture of consecration. Or you could say sanctification. Look at verse 19. And thou shalt take the other ram. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Now verse 20 is where we're going to get our points this morning. Notice some very unusual details but very important details in verse 20. Then shalt thou kill the ram and take of his blood. And put it upon first place. The tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons. So we're going to go... Uh, this morning talk about the ear and the importance of the ear more about that in a moment and then notice it says upon the tip or i'm sorry, right, sorry middle of verse 20 start over upon the thumb of their right hand so you got the right ear and you got the right hand so we'll talk about the hand the importance of the hand and then it says and upon the great toe of their right foot so we got the ear we've got the thumb of the right hand and we've got the big toe, the great toe, what we call it the big toe. So it says there, uh, last part of the verse, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So let's talk about the ear, the hand, and the foot this morning. And let's see if we can make a good application for those of us who are saved. So if you take a look there, that right ear, the ear, the importance of the ear. What's your ear? What's the most important thing that your ear does for you, folks? It is what you use to hear, right? Notice the word ear is inside the word hear. You ever notice that? H-E-A-R. So that's the, the instrument of hearing. So uh, the thumb of the right hand has to do with putting something in your hand and hanging on to it. 
which you're going to need to do if you're going to do any kind of work at all, right? Have you ever, when I taught biology, um, I used to take the kids through this little, little exercise of doing different daily tasks with your thumb taped to your palm. And if you have a writing utensil this morning, just put your thumb against your palm and try to write something legibly. Now, I do this with the kids, and they all say, I can still write. I can still do it legibly. I think they're cheap. It's very, very hard. Try, try to go through your day. Just, you don't have to do both hands. Do one hand. And take some duct tape and t take that thing there. You won't go five, ten minutes going around the house trying to do stuff. It's going to be a struggle. God made us with opposable thumbs. You know what they're for? For grasping things. You cannot hang on to something firmly, tightly, unless you have a thumb to do so. You ever notice that? So the thumb is connected with work. So the ear is connected with hearing. The thumb is connected with working. We'll get to that here in a moment. And then the last thing, that big toe. I'll say some things at the end of the message about the big toe. But you know that if you don't have a big toe, you will have a most difficult job doing what? You have a most difficult time walking. So we're going to talk about what you hear, what you're working on, or what you do this morning, and where you're walking. So those three things this morning. So let's talk about the first thing, hearing. Let's go back to Genesis 3. We'll be all over the Bible this morning, as is often the case here, which is a good thing. But go to back to Genesis 3. And this first point is hearing the word of the Lord. Because what more important words could you hear than God's words, right? So first point this morning, hearing the word of the Lord. And I'll ask you this question before we get into some of these verses. How has your hearing been lately? Now, I know some of us have really good hearing and some of us in here have not so good hearing. I'm not talking about your actual ability to hear because it's a little bit different for everybody. What I'm asking you is how's your hearing been lately concerning the hearing of God's words? Because Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, that's a great verse, Romans 10, 17 on hearing. And the most important thing you could hear would be God's word. Hopefully, hopefully you came this morning most importantly, to hear from who? From the Lord, from his word. That's the most important thing that you could, you could hear. So look at verse 8. Genesis 3, verse 8. Now, this is after Adam and Eve have sinned. And notice what happens in verse 8. And they, what's that next word? Heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. But look at the response. And Adam and his wife, what'd they do? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. You know why they're hiding? They had just sinned against God. They had broken the command that God gave them to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Both of them had. And I'll say this about that verse right there. Sin will keep you from hearing and being confronted with the word of God. You catch that? Sin will keep you from being confronted by God's word. You'll just put it off to the side so you're not confronted with it. So that's what happened here. Now, why is it that they are tuned out to God? Well, they just sinned. Let's get down to some specifics here. If you go down there to uh, verse 10, it, you, you can see here. Actually, look at read verse 9 here. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was what? You see how he does not want to be confronted by God, even though he's hearing his voice, because he's just sinned? Folks, sin will get you in a mess. Sin will cause you to tune God's word completely out. You will not want to hear from him. Now, if you go down there, you'll find out uh, that, uh, verse 17, verse 17, that's where I wanted to go. You find out why Adam doesn't want to hear from God. Look at what happened here. Uh, this is the Lord talking. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast, what's that next word? Hearkened unto the voice of who? Thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee. Uh, and he goes on there, reminding Adam what he told him. Folks, who did Adam listen to and hearken to instead of God? His wife. When you listen to anybody that's going to tell you something contrary to the scriptures, 
You better not hearken to it. Do you hear that? This is nothing against the ladies. It doesn't matter who it is. Anybody who tells you something contrary to the scriptures and you take heed to it and, and listen to that instead of God, you're heading down the wrong path. You're going to hide from the Lord. You're not going to hear from the Lord. So uh, notice that very interesting there about Adam. Genesis 3 kind of sets a precedent for how we often are. We sin, and the last thing we want to do when we sin is hear from God because that's going to cause us to have to deal with our sin. We're going to have to say something that none of us like saying. Lord, I was wrong. Lord, I have sinned against you. Now, none of us here enjoy that. All of us, time to time, need to do that. Genesis 3, well, it really lays it out very clear, doesn't it? Now, let's go to a good example here. So there's the, the one not to follow. How about we look at one that we should follow? Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, and you probably know who I'm going to talk about. Chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. There's the bad example in Genesis 3. People don't want to hear from God because of sin. Here's a young man who doesn't know the Lord, but he's ready to listen to the Lord. This is Samuel, 1 Samuel 3. Go down there to verse 7. This is where the Lord's calling Samuel because he's, he's about done with Eli, so he's going to start using Samuel because Eli sinned against him. And if you go down there to verse 7, 1 Samuel 3, 7, the Bible says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Well, that's a really good verse there. That verse tells me, that the only way for anybody to know the Lord is to know the word of the Lord. How is it that you know God? You only know about God. You only know God through what you are told about him in his word. So and this is a time in, in the history of uh, Israel where they probably only had the first five books of the Bible. That's, that's all they had, the, the, the law. Yet the word was the way that they knew God. They knew God through his word. Same is true today. Now look at verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Verse 9. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Folks, you might want to underline that in your Bible. There is the right response to hearing from God. Oftentimes, uh, you might want to open your Bible, and before you start reading, say, Lord, uh, speak, for I am ready to hear you. To let the Lord know you're, you're serious about this. Uh, there's a verse in Psalm 119, and I cannot remember the verse. Uh, it says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law, which is a great prayer before you open the word of God and start reading. Lord, show me what you want me to see today. All right, so Samuel, great example of how we ought to hear. Now go to your New Testament. Go to Mark chapter 4. And the Lord Jesus Christ will tell us some things here about hearing. Uh, I had here, and we don't have time for this, but 2 Kings 23 You'll read about a fellow named Josiah, one of the kings of Israel. And you'll find out that there was a revival in that nation. Because one man discovered the book of the law in the house of the Lord. It was brought to him, the king. And he said, we're in trouble because the Lord's going to be upset at us for not listening to him. And then he gets the whole nation together and he reads the words of the law to them. And the whole nation says, we're going to start living for God. We're going to start doing right. All because the book was taken and read and obeyed. So the importance of hearing from God. Go to Mark chapter 4. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole parable of the sower, but I'm going to go down to the interpretation of the parable of the sower, which is given by the Lord. Go down there to Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Mark 4, verse 14. And what you'll see here as we read is different responses to the word of God. And you're going to see that some hear, yet they don't really take it to the next step. Look at verse 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, what happens? Satan cometh immediately 
and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Folks, I really believe every time we come to church and open up the scriptures and read it, that the devil is just waiting to try to steal it out of somebody's heart. I mean, right here among us. Uh, he's trying to steal it out of the preacher's heart if he can. He's trying to get you so far distracted from hearing from the Lord. He's really good at it too. Putting all these things on your mind when you ought to be focused on hearing from the Lord. Folks, that's why when we come to church or when you're, when you're at home and you open up your Bible, anytime this book is opened up and read and studied, you better believe there's spiritual opposition to you hearing from God. And can't you see the world we're living in, how few people are actually opening up the scriptures and reading what God said? People are crazy. You know why they're so crazy? They've just left the word of God. I'm talking about Christians too. You've seen Christians behave in a strange way here in the last year because they've departed from the word of God and they decided to listen to every voice under the sun except from the Lord. So uh, look at verse 15, uh, or actually verse 16. It says, uh, the next, the next uh, type of person. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. Okay, that sounds good. But then look at verse 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are what? These are people who are excited about the word of God. They start getting into it. But then one of their friends comes along and says, you must be out of your mind for believing that book. And they say, yeah, maybe you're right. And they just completely leave it. And I've seen, you've been in church for a while. You've seen people come to church, get all excited about learning the, the, the Bible. And that excitement just kind of just goes down after a week or so. Maybe a little longer than that sometimes. But they're all excited and then boom. And what's happened is somebody has told them, man, you must be crazy for believing that. Or something happened where they were offended or persecuted. And they say, I want nothing to do with that anymore. So sad, but it happens all the time. Look at the next one here. Look at verse uh, 18. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. But then verse 19. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in. What happens? Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So here you've got people who are ready to hear, but then they're distracted by all the things of this world, and there's never any fruit. I think you've got Christians probably in that boat right there. They get saved, and then they, there's a time where they're excited, then the world rushes in and completely distracts them, and there's never any fruit. Look at verse 20. Here's the good type. Verse 20 is the one out of four is, is good ground here. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some and 100. Out of the four, there's the type that we all want to be. You hear it, you keep hearing it, you receive it, and what does it do over time? It causes you to be a fruitful Christian. You know how the fruit of the Spirit is going to come out of you? It's going to be from spending time in the Word of God. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. The fruit of the Spirit comes from the Spirit of God working in you, hand-in-hand hand with the Word of God working in you. That's, that's how God's work gets done. So I'll tell you, if you're saved, you want to commit to be a continual hearer of God's word. Uh, you don't have to go there, but John 8, 31, the Lord says, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So don't just be a one-time hearer for salvation. Be a continual hearer to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So go back to Exodus here. I'll hit this next point, but I want to tell you a little story here before we go back there. There was an Indian, American Indian, who left the reservation to visit the big lights and glamour of New York City. Never been there before. So he's walking down a busy street with a friend of his, and uh, he stops and he says, this is the Indian talking, he says, I hear crickets. And his friend says, y you must be out of your mind. I mean, we're in the middle of New York City here, busy streets. Uh, there's all this noise. Uh, you're not hearing crickets. You, you must be hearing something else. And the, uh, the Indian says, no, I'm 100% certain I hear crickets. Sure of it. So his friend goes back and forth. He's like, man, you must be out of your mind. Finally, the, the Indian says, um, uh, hold on a second. Why don't you come with me? And he takes a short walk over to where there's a, a large cement planter with a shrub. 
And he does a little digging in the ground, and what do you know? There's crickets there. So his friend says, wow, how did you know that there were crickets nearby? You've got amazing hearing. Here's what the Indian said. He said, nope. My ears are no different from yours. It simply depends on what you're listening to. He says, let me show you. So the Indian reaches into his pocket, pulls out a bunch of change, dimes, quarters, nickels, and he just drops them on the concrete. And goes, what do you think happened? Everybody nearby turns and looks because they heard the noise, the sound of change hitting the ground. And the Indian said to his friend, he says, now you see, it all depends on what you're listening for. And I'll tell you, the reason why a lot of times we don't hear the Lord speak is because the sounds of the world are crowding out the word of the Lord, and we don't hear. What are you tuned into this morning? What are you tuned into this morning, right now? Hopefully not me, but what God said. That's what you ought to be tuned into when you come to church and the Bible's open. I'll ask you this. What are you tuned into when you're singing out of the hymn book? It's so easy, especially if you've been in church as long as I have, to sing and not think at all about what you're singing. Because you've done it so many times. It's the same song you've sung probably hundreds of times. Folks, that's a fruitless act if you're not thinking about what you're singing. What's the purpose of you singing? Who are you supposed to be singing to? Aren't you supposed to be singing unto the Lord? Therefore, you've got to think about what you're singing. And if you do that, you'll, you ever notice Brandon up here in the middle of a song will say amen when he's leading you? You know why? He's thinking about what he's singing, and it's exciting to him. I think that's a good, that's a good practice. Think about what you're singing. It'll get you focused on the Lord. It'll keep the distractions of this world out. And I'll tell you, we start singing some of those old hymns about the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and his resurrection, it'll get you excited if you're thinking about it and you know what it does for you. So focus on the Lord. What have you been listening for recently? I hope you've been listening to the Lord. Uh, let's go back there to Exodus 29 here. And I, I mentioned there the ear. Uh, looking at verse 20 again. Mention the ear. Let's go on to the next thing here. We had the right ear. That's where the blood was applied. And then notice the thumb of their right hand. Now, and by the way, this was something that had to happen with the priests before they could actually do any work in the tabernacle. Now, did you catch that? Before they could do any work, they had to go through this consecration act with the blood being applied to the ear, the thumb of the right hand, and then their, the great toe of the right foot before they could do anything for the Lord. So let's talk about the right hand and what this has to do with anything. Go back there to Genesis 3. That's always a great place to get the the origin of a bunch of things in your Bible, in the book of Genesis, and specifically chapter 3. Go back there, keep your finger in Exodus, and let's take a look at the hand for a moment. The hand. You know, your hand can work for the Lord, and should be used for that. Your hand can also get you in some trouble. And take a look at this. Look down there at Genesis 3, 20, um, uh, let's go back there to 3, um, Go down to 322, and you will see a little detail here on um, what happened earlier with Adam here. Go to Genesis 322. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his what? His hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Now, that's mentioned in there how the Lord kept Adam from taking of the tree of life. But folks, what did Adam have to use and Eve as well, in order to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They had to use their hand, right? To take the fruit off of the tree before they put it in their mouth. Why did both of them decide to reach forth their hand and take of the fruit? It had to do with something that they, help me out here, heard. Remember how the devil came along there, the serpent? And said, uh, basically, uh, the Lord's not telling you the truth. That's what he was saying, in essence. And as a result of what they heard, particularly Eve, what she heard, she took forth her, put forth her hand and took of that fruit. Isn't that something? The hand was affected by the hearing. Now, you know what's true for me and you? 
What we do is affected by what we, help me out, hear. What we do is affected by what we hear. And I'm not just talking about only what your hand does. I'm talking about what we do as far as really anything. Our hands are often involved in what we do, though. So uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, this thing about hearing and doing. This past week, I heard something that absolutely infuriated me. I just heard it. And immediately after hearing it, within the next probably 15 to 20 seconds, the blood pressure and the heart rate, all it took was me hearing something. You know what I wanted to do? You know what I wanted to do after I heard? I wanted to wring somebody's neck. I didn't do it, don't worry. But I was my first thought. I was angry because of something I heard, and I really wanted to do something that I should not have done, and I didn't do it, thank the Lord. But isn't that something how our hearing so affects our doing? You ever notice that? Our hearing so affects what we do. My guess is the reason why a lot of Christians aren't really doing anything for God is because they're not hearing from Him. What do you think? People that are hearing from Him regularly are probably involved in doing something for Him. There's a connection there between what you hear and what you do. So I thought, rather than, uh, we've, we've kind of been some negative things here this morning, I thought what we'd do is let's look at a great example of hearing and doing. Kind of looked at the negative example there in Genesis. Go to Nehemiah. I mentioned this fellow here recently in some sermons. And I tell you, this guy, there's a lot of people that I want to meet when we get to heaven. But I want to talk to this guy and get a little bit more insight on how things happened here uh, whenever he went back and rebuilt the walls. He tells you a lot. But this guy, you want to read a book about perseverance. You want to read a book about a guy being opposed over and over, and he just kept saying, we're going to do this for the Lord. We're going to do this. Nothing's going to stop us. The Lord's going to help us. I know that God wants me to do this. We're going to do it with the Lord's help, of course. Just keeps on going. All right, so look at two. We're going to look at a few different passages here in New Nehemiah. Look at chapter two. Go down there to verse 18, and you'll find out in the first chapter that Nehemiah has this, this uh, uh idea of going to Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls and the Lord is wanting him to do that. He gets confirmation that the Lord wants him to do that. Look at verse 18. Uh, Nehemiah goes and scouts out the city, sees all that's happened there and, and realizes that some work's got to be done. And look what happens in verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, and these are the people that were going to help him. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their what? Their hands for this good work. Uh, they were going to have to do some work that involves some serious labor. So they said, let's get to work. We need some strong hands to do this work. Now, if we stop right there, everything's great. Nehemiah's got this vision of uh, rebuilding these walls. The Lord wants him to do it. He's got a, at least a, a team of people. I don't know how many, but he's got some people to help him. And they say, let's go. Look at the next verse, verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, what did they do? They laughed us to scorn. Hey, there's the affliction and persecution that the word brings. They laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do when you rebel against the king? You see in that opposition there? Trying to stop, and they keep showing up, and I'll show you that couple different places here in Nehemiah where they do that. Look at verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. You know why he said what he did there in verse 20? He's talking to an Arabian and an Ammonite and a Horonite. None of them were promised any land by God. So Nehemiah says, God gave us this land. You can just leave. We're going to do this for the Lord. We don't really care what you do, but you ain't stopping us because the Lord wants us to do that. What if some Christians had that attitude today? You know that God wants you to do something and nothing's going to stop you because the Lord's going to help you get it done. Amen? Side note, we got VBS coming up. I think that the Lord would have us minister to children around this community. What do you think? I'm telling you, we're a couple weeks away. 
there'll probably be a little opposition between now and then and probably during that week. Uh, with the Lord's help, with the Lord's help only, we're just going to keep going. Amen? And you can expect there'll probably be some things along the way that will try to distract from something getting done here for eternity, but we'll just say, Lord, help us, and we'll just keep on going as long as the Lord gives us the strength to do so. Amen? If you're not involved in that, there's a meeting after church, a little advertisement. You can get involved in that. The work of God here, right here in our community here in the next couple of weeks. And I'll tell you, say some more things about that later. Go to chapter 4 of Nehemiah. You'll see this again and again in Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, we're going to go do this. And then here comes the opposition. Look at verse, verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof. Watch this little phrase here. I got this underlined in my Bible. For the people had a mind to do what? What did they have to use in order to get the work done? They had to use their hands, didn't they? Look at verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, look at verse 9. We made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. You know what Nehemiah said? We're going on for the Lord. We're going to go on and work. You can try to stop us. We're moving on. Go to chapter uh, 4, verse 17, just a few verses down there. You can see what they were doing as they built. Folks, while you're working, you want to be aware of things and people around you trying to stop you from working for the Lord. Look at this verse, 417. Then, uh, or 17, they which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand, what did they have? Held a weapon. Look at verse 18. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. You know what they did? They're working, but they are also armed as they work. Hey, folks, if you're going to get any work done for the Lord, you better be armed. You don't need your concealed carry in the state of Florida to be armed either. We're talking about spiritual work here. Are you armed? Hey, we had a verse this morning. Talk about take, uh, take fast hold of instruction. Maybe you've seen that word in your Bible. Fast, hold fast or fast hold. Fast does not mean quick. Does not mean speedy. It has the idea of something fastened fastened to you if something is fastened to you it's attached which means it could become a part of you it should become a part of you the word of god should become a part of you right it should be fastened to you so it can't be taken away so pretty neat there go to chapter six in nehemiah one more here chapter six working for the lord you're going to have opposition keep working for the lord look at chapter six look down there at verse five uh, actually uh, back up to verse three here you'll see nehemiah uh, actually, let's go one more to verse 2. Verse 2. Then Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do what? They thought to do me mischief. Look at verse 3, the, the response. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? There's a whole, there's a whole sermon in this, in this passage right here about people trying to waste your time. People trying to get you away from doing what God wants you to do. There's a whole sermon right there. You got any people that just kind of come along and take your time away? And maybe they're well-meaning sometimes, but man, they just time wasters. You got to be aware of those people. Look at verse 4. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Notice how relentless the opposition is. They just keep coming. Verse 5. Then sent Salambella a servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. Where it was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashemu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And that's a straight up lie, what he said there. Verse 7, and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel. What's that next word? Notice the ecumenical front here. Hey, come along with us. We're on your side. 
Nehemiah saw right through that because those guys were out to get him. Look at verse 8. Then I sent it to him saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. He's calling them out as a liar right there. Verse 9. For they all made us what? See what fear will do? It will paralyze you. Stop you from doing something for God. They all made us afraid saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Notice that little prayer that he throws up there. A little short one, isn't it? But very effective. Lord, strengthen my hands. Folks, the work will be opposed. When you set out to do something for God, it will be opposed. Keep doing the work. Amen? And trust God along the way to give you the strength and the energy to keep doing the work. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, your New Testament. Last thing here on work, and then we'll get to this last point real quick. Matthew chapter 5. Why do you work for God? Here's a great verse on why you should work for God. Familiar verse, verse 16, Matthew 5, verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good, what? Works and glorify who? Your Father which is in heaven. Our works are not for us. They are for the glory of God. How's your light shining? If your light's shining, you're reflecting the light of Jesus Christ so the world can see it. And that is work to be done that is for the glory of God. Hey, folks, uh, I used to sing the song when I was a kid. Many of you did hear. This little light of mine, right? We'll let it shine. And you get to the part where you say, hide it under a bushel. No! I used to love saying that when I was a kid. You know what we end up doing when we're adults? Hide it under a bushel. And hide it under a bushel. Forgot what we said when we were kids. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. A kid song with all kinds of deep theological truth in it. Let your light so shine before men so God gets the glory. Amen? Now, I'll tell you a story. This is kind of a funny story here about a man that was the laziest man in town. And one day, here he goes running through town. He's a lazy guy. Nobody's ever seen him run in his life. So a guy sees him. I mean, this guy, his hat's off. His coat was flying in the wind. And he's speeding along in there. And uh, one of his friends is shocked to see him running. And he says, hey, Sam, what on earth has made you run and run so fast? Sam responds, I can't wait. I heard of some work. And his friend said, well, you, you mean you got a job? And he said, the man, Sam, said, I don't know. Uh, I just heard about it. I'm going to go find out. And his friend says, well, good success to you, Sam. What kind of work is it? And Sam responds, some washing for my wife. And he was running as fast as he could away from the house so he didn't have to do any work that he heard about. Now, it's kind of silly, but some people are like Sam. They say this, hear my Lord, send somebody else. You hear about work that needs to be done, and you run as fast as you can so you don't have to do the work. Don't be like that, folks. There's work to be done spiritually for the Lord. Get engaged in the work. And I'll just ask you, what kind of work for God have you been engaged in recently? Think about the work you've done, maybe in the past week or the past month, well, what you did, the work, the time you spent working on various things, will it matter in a year what you did? Will it matter in 10 or 20 years what you did? You start thinking about what you've done in just the last week, and you'll realize a lot of what I did in the last week is not going to matter next week or the week after that or the month after that. And we spend a lot of time on things that don't really matter. You know what kind of work you want to be involved in? The work that will still be important in eternity. Amen. That's doing work for the Lord. That's telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a, you know what is, is a labor that you can do anytime, anywhere. That is highly profitable. And so few Christians engage in it is praying. Yeah. Folks, that's a labor. It, you get down to pray. When you get down to pray, there's a thousand distractions come your way, right? You can think of all the things you need to do when you go down to pray, don't you? You can't remember all the things you got to do that day, but then you go down to pray and all of a sudden, here they come. 
Folks, it's a labor to pray, but it's a worthwhile endeavor because it counts forever. The things that you pray for, hopefully you're praying about some spiritual things while you pray, those are things that count forever. Praying for folks to get saved. You know what you can pray for this week? You can pray for VBS. Uh, in the years past, we've had kids get saved. Amen? We've had kids realize how important the Word of God is at VBS, and that's something that should last forever, right? When they get a hold of that, get a hold of God's Word. So think about the work you've been doing and what kind of work you've been doing is actually worthwhile work. Spend, I know we all got to spend time doing things. I realize there's things we got to do every day that we just have to do that are important that day and maybe not much beyond that. There are certain things that just involve that. But then there's also a lot of time we got that we could invest in eternal work for God, right? Spending time praying for folks. Spending time in God's word and asking the Lord as you read, Lord, give me somebody this week that I can talk to about what I just read. It's amazing how the Lord will answer that prayer if you've not prayed that before. So be involved in spiritual work. So there's the hand, the right hand and the thumb. Uh, go back to Exodus 29. We'll get this last thing real quick here. Exodus 29. And uh, we've got the, the ear for hearing. We've got the thumb on the hand for working. And then we've got the big toe, the great toe. What do you think that's for? That's for walking. So we've got hearing the word of the Lord. We've got uh, doing the work of the Lord with the hand. And then here's the last one, walking the way of the Lord. So Exodus 29, you find out that they put this blood on the great toe of their right foot. Very interesting, the big toe. Now, you don't want to experiment with this. Just trust me on this, and you can do your own research. If you did not have a big toe, you would not be able to have any balance at all. When you run or walk fast, you put pressure on your big toe. If you had no big toe, guess what's going to happen when you take that first step? You're going to be face to the ground. That's where you're going to be. So without the big toe, you're going to have a hard time walking. So let's talk about walking the way of the Lord. Go to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Just a couple verses here to close. Deuteronomy 13. Walking the way of the Lord. You've got to have that big toe or else you're not going to be able to walk. And again, these three things, the ear, the hand, or the thumb particularly, and the big toe, these things want to be committed to the Lord so that you can hear from them, you can work for them, and you can walk with the Lord. So go to Deuteronomy 13. Look at verse 4. Commandment from the Lord to the Israelites. Ye shall, what's that next word? Walk after the Lord your God. That means he's in the lead. Walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his what? Voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. I told you earlier there's a connection between what you hear and what you do. In that verse, I see there's a connection between what you hear and where you go. And all three go together. What you hear, what you do, where you're walking, where you're going, they all go hand in hand. All right, go back. Um, if you would, we're going to go to the New Testament for a couple verses. But go find Judges chapter 1 first. Keep a finger there because we're going to end up there. And go to your New Testament, way in the back, go to 2 John. It's only a chapter, so it's kind of tough to find. Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 2 John. So find 2 John. It's only one chapter. A couple verses on walking here. Walking the way of the Lord. And then we'll go back to Judges, and I'll show you something really interesting in closing. Go to 2 John. It's only one chapter. Go down there to verse 4. 2 John, verse 4. And he says here, this is John. And uh, he addresses uh, the lady that he writes to and her children. Verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. If you're going to walk the way of the Lord, you're going to have to hear from the word of the Lord. And that would be walking in his truth. Go down there to verse 6. You'll see another verse on this. And this is love. That we, next word, walk after his commandments. This is the commandment. That as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Notice the connection between hearing and walking. What you hear will affect what you do and where you go. Now I'm talking about spiritual things here. Hear from the Lord. It'll be more likely that you be involved in spiritual work and walk the way of the Lord 
if you start off with hearing from him. And by the way, there's all kinds of voices. Go back to Judges here. All kinds of voices in this world, aren't there? And you found in the last week, just in the last week, there's voices that this world was listening to for 15 months. And suddenly you find out those voices have not been telling the truth. If you don't know what I'm talking about, see me after. Isn't that something? The heralded authority from the scientific community that everybody has heeded for the last 15 months, we found out he's been telling some things that are not so true lately. Or actually, not just lately, it's been for a while. Isn't that something? You know what people have been doing? They've been listening to that voice for all these months. And now they're told it was the wrong voice to listen to. And the people who weren't listening to him for 15 months were said, you know what was said about them? Something's wrong with you. Are you crazy? Don't you know the, the, the science? Isn't that something, folks? You've got to be very careful about the voices you hear from. Be very careful about that. You, you'll, what you'll notice in the whole, whole side note here, but this is where we are in our world today, there's been an agenda attached to the voices that people have been listening to. Folks, the Lord has an agenda too. Did you know that? His agenda is to get work done for Him and walk with Him. Doesn't matter what the rest of the world does. Amen? Right. Judges chapter 1. You want, you want to talk about a strange illustration to end on, but oh, it is, is it ever applicable. Judges 1 verse 4. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. He's the king. And they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled. Now watch this. And they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. What in the world? There's a reason why they did that. Look at verse 7. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings have their thumbs, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Sounds like this guy had been taken captives of all these kings, 70 kings, and instead of killing them, he would disable them. Because without thumbs and big toes, they would be completely ineffective in a fight against him. What happens when he gets captured by the Israelites? Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap, correct? And he got it. That's not my point. My point is, here's a guy that lost his thumbs and big toes. He still had life, but he couldn't do anything, and he couldn't go anywhere. He's completely unbalanced because he lost his thumbs and he lost his toes. You know what the devil would love to do to Christians today? Disarm you. Keep you from hearing from God. Because if that's the case, it's as if you don't have any thumbs because you're not doing any work for God if you're not hearing from Him, most likely. And if you're not hearing from God, it's a good chance you're probably not walking with Him either. I read that about Adonai Bezek, and I look around and I think, man, there's some Christians that I can think of that are a whole lot like this fella. They've been completely disarmed. They act as if they have no thumbs because they never do anything for God. And they don't have any big toes. It seems like they don't ever walk with the Lord. So what are they doing? They're kind of useless, aren't they? Folks, have Adonai Bezek serve as an example for all of us. That we need to make sure that we're getting work done for the Lord. And we're walking with the Lord. And it all begins with the first point today. Hearing from the Lord. So three things this morning. I'll just ask you here in closing. How's it with you? What have you been listening to? Who have you been hearing from? Have the voices of this world been drowning out the voice of the Lord? Again, this book is important every day of your life. Doesn't matter how many times you read it. Get in it every day and hear from God. And if you do that, you know what will happen? You'll probably be more inclined to get work done for the Lord. Next question. How you been doing with your work for the Lord? Has your labor only been in things that are temporary instead of the eternal how's your work been lately last thing what direction are you walking here's a good question to ask has your walk with god been wayward or have you been walking in close fellowship with him hey i don't know the answer to those questions in anybody's life but mine you know the answer to those questions and the lord does as well 
So I encourage you to do business with the Lord this morning, particularly in these three areas we looked at. So let's have a word of prayer here and we'll have an invitation. Lord, sure thank you for what you've shown us this morning. Some really good examples from the scriptures. Uh, I pray that all of us here in this church would truly be hearers from you, hearers of you, of your word, and be about your business doing work for you and walking with you. And uh, we do want to just ask that uh, our VBS coming up here, what an opportunity we've got to do something for you. I pray that it is a highly profitable time in the life of our church and our area, and you would do spiritual work that week. I just want to ask, Lord, this time of invitation, that uh, you be honored in the response of folks right here, and that you do something with the message that went forth from your word this morning that would be bring forth fruit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.